Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. Okay, today on the Dungeon Dive, we are going to take a look at Shadowgate, the Living Castle. This game was provided to the Dungeon Dive as a review copy from Trick or Treat Studios. Let's read a little bit about Shadowgate, the Living Castle on the back of the box here. Five to find, three are one, one gives access, the bladed sun, the silver orb to banish below, the staff of ages to vanquish the foe, joining to the golden thorn, the last to invoke, the platinum horn. You have heard this prophecy many times, one regarding the chosen hero that will save the Westland from the great and rising darkness. Those days are now before you. For Talamar the Starless, the Warlock Lord, is once again moving in his world. He has descended far below Castle Shadowgate, ready to release a creature of immense power upon the world and bring it into chaos. Based on the award-winning video game, you'll explore Shadowgate, the living castle, discovering relics and spells, and completing legendary quests. Compete against other players to piece together the fabled Staff of Ages. It is only then... Will you be able to confront the Warlock Lord, fulfill the prophecy, and be crowned High Lord of the West Land? So Shadowgate, uh, the board game, is based off of an old video game from the mid-80s, around I think around 1987. And it was from a series of video games called Mac Venture Video Games. And these were point-and-click adventure games developed for the old Macintosh computers. And that's right, they were in black and white. I'll show some pictures here. I never played Shadowgate on the Macintosh, but I did play Uninvited and Deja Vu on the Macintosh. Those are two other games in the Mac Venture series. Uh, Shadowgate enjoyed quite a bit of popularity. It also went on to be on the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System and a couple of other systems. And these games were developed by a, uh, a small developer called ICOM Simulations. What was interesting about their games is they took kind of a different approach to the computer adventure game. In a lot of the games that were out at that time, like Kingsfield and some of the text-based adventure games, part of the game, which led to a lot of frustration, was figuring out how you typed in the commands in order for the computer to recognize what you were trying to do. I remember spending a lot of time in King's Quest just trying to use certain items and trying to uh, kill a snake or something, but I couldn't figure out what the computer, that I couldn't figure out the syntax that the computer expected me to type in order to do the thing I needed to do. Shadowgate, what, uh, what and the Mac Venture games, what ICOM Solutions did is they created an entire system where everything is controlled by the mouse and you are clicking on items, you are clicking on commands. And so they kind of simplified the adventure game and kind of boiled it down to its bare essentials. Now, in the back of the manual in Shadowgate, we do have a little bit of information, a little bit of history on the video game, basically the characters that you can play as in the board game and where they came from. I would have liked to have seen a lot more uh, background information on the history of the video game included in the manual. I think this game will appeal to people who really enjoy the video game and have some nostalgia for the video game. So I would have liked to have seen them embrace that a little bit and kind of, you know, give us some background information, give us a little bit of history, uh, maybe even uh, an interview or something with the original creators. I think that would be super cool. One of the things I did think was cool though, and this is very tangential, but uh, bear with me. A few of the characters that you can play in the board game are from the Before Shadowgate novel from 1991. Now, there was a series of novels called the Worlds of Power novels, and these were novels that were all based on video games, uh, basically Nintendo video games. We had one for Ninja Gaiden. We had one, I think, for Metal Gear Solid. We had a, a, a Castlevania, a Mega Man and a Shadowgate novel. Now, I don't have any of those, but the one I do have is from one of my all-time favorite Nintendo games, and that is Blaster Master. All of the uh, Worlds of Power books were created by FX9, obviously a pseudonym. Uh, I'm not sure who actually wrote each one, but I thought it was really cool that I actually had one of these Worlds of Power books to show you. 
And one of the things that I think is super cool, now these were uh, very early chapter books written for young kids, but at the end of the Blaster Master novel, the uh, FX9 actually recommends a few books for kids to further their reading adventures. And I think this is awesome because he says, or they say, Dear Reader, I hope you liked reading Blaster Master. Here is a list of some other books that I thought you might like. And all of these books do kind of have similar themes to Blaster Master. In Blaster Master, you were playing as a kid and your, your, your frog uh, went down this hole, <laughs> your pet frog, and you had to rescue your pet frog and you ended up finding this kind of alien tank thing. But a lot of the, um, uh, the these uh, book recommendations kind of follow a similar theme. So FX9 here recommends A Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne, My Teacher is an Alien by Bruce Koval, Starship Troopers by Robert Heinlein, The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, The White Mountains Trilogy, I think that's the Tripods Trilogy by John Christopher, and A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Engel. So very cool. These worlds of power are kind of like relics from the past, but I did just want to share this with you since I actually had one and it is tangentially related to Shadowgate. So Shadowgate, uh, Shadowgate is kind of an adventure game. It is a competitive game and I usually don't look a lot at competitive games on the dungeon dive. When I approach competitive games, I will usually play them solo in the same way that I do, you know, something like Talisman or something like Runebound. But those games are the, the competitive nature is usually just kind of a race to see who can uh, win first, who can beat the game first. Shadowgate feels more like a competitive card game rather than an adventure game. And so my opinion on the game may be skewed a little bit. I have had fun playing it, but I think the game would uh, playing it solo, I should say. But I think the game would be a heck of a lot more fun playing it competitively because of some of the clever card play, some of the clever combinations, some of the ways you can kind of screw your opponents over with some take, some very light take that elements. So I think this game will appeal more to people who want a kind of thematic competitive game. And I don't know if I can necessarily recommend this to anybody who would just be playing it solo. So uh, in the game, let's do a, a quick overview and then we'll go into some things I like and some of my criticisms. So in the game, you will be playing any number of characters. There are eight different characters you can play as, such as uh, Jer Kuthgar there or um, Fezlin Quickfoot. And then on the back of each one of these is another character, Willow Mir and Gorin True Strike. In this game here, I was playing with uh, Lakmir the Timeless and I was playing here with Thuridon Ray and uh, the human paladin. So on your character, you will have a certain number of stats such as strength, resourcefulness, and mind. And those will be used to overcome certain challenges. Each of the characters will have a special power. And then each of the characters will have a special power that becomes active when you are fully equipped with a complement of weapons and items. As soon as you fill up all of these equipment slots, you get to unlock your ultimate and then you can use a super ability. And so what you are doing in this game is you are going into Shadowgate Castle and you are trying to solve a series of quests. We're going to move down to the board just a little bit here. Okay, so over here we have a little bit of the board here and uh, on the board, you will always have four active quests. And these quests are drawn from decks of cards that range from uh, quests one. As you move through quests one, you will be moving into the keep, into quests two. As you find a card in quest two, you will then unlock the towers and the mines. And then you can move into quests, uh, the quest three deck. All of these quests can always be available at any time. You can cycle quests in and out. And that is part of the strategy and part of uh, building combinations is uh, making sure to get the right quests out that you need to solve those quests. The uh, quests will have a various cost that you have to pay or beat. So to beat this quest here in the study, I would need to have a strength power of two or more and a magical token matching this symbol. There are three different uh, types of magical tokens here that you can get throughout the game. And then you can spend these as a currency to overcome or, or to solve quests. Each quest will have a little bit of flavor text at the top here, the study. You believe this hidden room must have been a wizard's private study. Three fire pits are set into the floor. 
when you solve this quest, it is worth 10 victory points at the end of the game. You're going to tally up all of your victory points and or experience points, they call them here, and the player with the most wins the game. The players are working together to get through Shadowgate Tower and to uh, beat a final boss. Final boss, there are three final quest cards. Each one of these will represent a final boss that the players will have to fight together. The Behemoth, the Reaper, or the Warlock Lord. Whoever lands the final blow gets 50 XP, and uh, that is a really good chance that they are going to win if you are able to kill that final boss. But you are working together to get there. You are working together to kill the final boss, but the winner of the game is the player with the most experience points. There are a few different types of quests. We have red quests here. These are events. When these come out, they are triggered, and then usually the players will have to do something. They might have to roll some dice. They might have to discard some cards, or they might have to uh, take a penalty until that card goes away. So red cards are event cards, such as this hidden alcove. When this card was placed on the board, each player rolls two black dice. Whoever rolls the highest wins, and then you get the reward here and you would get a puzzle piece. There are green quest cards. These are monster cards. These are things that you have to fight. So uh, the guard room, the guard room is actually a room in the video game. I watched a playthrough of the video game in my preparation for, uh, for this review here. So this says uh, your entrance into the dingy smoke filled guard room goes unnoticed by its intoxicated occupants. To uh, solve this quest, you need to have a mind of two and a resourcefulness of three. If you fail to do that, you get a death card. If you uh, beat that quest, you get a puzzle piece. And then you can also take an item discard from the discard pile. We'll talk about items in just a minute. So puzzle pieces are interesting and we'll talk about those in just a minute as well. We have these gray cards. These are just general quests here. Uh, this quest here, you have to have two magic tokens in order to beat this quest and then you get two items. And then we also have these puzzles. So in a point and click adventure game like Shadowgate, a lot of the game, a lot of the video game, your time is spent solving puzzles, combining items, using items on other items. And so this game simulates that by having these puzzle quests then you also have a deck of puzzle items here. So in order to solve this bookshelf puzzle, you need to find the puzzle item of the historic tome. If you do that, you will get 10 XP at the end of the game. And you can also stash your historic tome as a victory point card. So as you're playing through the game, you will be rewarded at certain times with puzzle items. Uh, let's find that historic tome here. So there's the historic tome. So the bookshelf says here, uh, Book after ancient book, the accumulated knowledge in this large library must be truly staggering. And then if you are able to find this historic tome, the name of this book has faded, having been lost to both time and elements. This puzzle item is used in the bookshelf puzzle. And up here it tells you that that bookshelf puzzle is in quest deck two. That's really important because you might find this item, this puzzle item at another time in the game. You might have already gone through uh, quest deck two and seen that quest out here, but it gets cycled back in because somebody didn't want to solve it because nobody had the historic tome at that time. But later on, a few turns later, you might find the historic tome in a random draw. Well, then you know that that is in quest deck two. So you can start cycling quests out of the active quests through quest deck two in order to get, in order to kind of backtrack back to that library. I think that's a really clever way of simulating that kind of backtracking in a video game where you might pass a locked door, you might pass something that needs a certain item, you find the item later and you come back to that item to solve that puzzle. That's super cool. I really do enjoy the way that that is used there. Other uh, things that you might find throughout your questing and you get as rewards and you will need to equip are these item cards. And there are all kinds of different item cards. There are weapons and there are uh, sh shields, different kinds of armor, different kinds of magical items. We have these general items such as torches. For those of you who have played the video game, you know how important it is to keep your torches lit in the video game. If your torches ever go out, your characters die. Well, in this game, the torch is a track and it starts ticking down. And as it starts ticking down, you will have to roll these red dice 
And if depending on the symbol that is rolled, a curse token will come out that will make everybody's hero uh, less powerful in that certain attribute. You will also start to take death cards. And as players uh, uninvited, all of the Mac Adventure games had really cool and creative ways for your characters to die. And in this game, whenever you die, you take a death card and you will lose five points at the end of the game. But we have things like scimitars. We have these kind of magical items here, the robe of the court and the coat of arms, or maybe you can summon an elemental. There are war hammers, there are spells and skulls, all kinds of different items. These items will give you bonuses to your attributes. And a lot of these items can also be discarded in order to solve a quest. However, this is where some of the creative uh, card play comes. So you can solve a quest. So this quest here, you would discard two general items to solve the apothecary quest. Let's say I had these two items in my inventory, scrying dice and ancient scroll. I could discard those and then I would gain one item and I could discard a curse token. However, if I also had this item here, there's a bonus item on the quest. And if you discard an item in your inventory or an equipped item that matches that bonus symbol, those can also go into your completed quest stack and then you can get those additional points at the end of the game. So you're giving up any abilities those cards have in order to gain victory points. And so that is kind of where I think this game really does focus on that competitive uh, nature of the game because of this creative card use. You can either use the card to help you solve quests, you can use the cards to make your characters stronger, or you can discard the cards at certain time to gain more victory points. And so basically what you are doing is you are going through quest after quest. Anytime there is an empty quest slot, you can fill up another quest. You are uh, competing to get quests. You are competing to get items in order to unlock the final quest and face off against the final boss. Uh, all three of the staff items need to be found. Uh, right now, one of my characters has the Gallon Staff and the Golden Horn. All we need to find now is the Silver Orb. And you need to find one specific room in Quest Deck 3 in the Towers and Mines in order to unlock the, uh, the, the, the final uh, passage to the final quest and defeat the boss. Okay, so there are a few things that I really do like about Shadowgate, and one is the art. I think the art is fantastic. All of the art is done by a company called Zojoy, and they actually also publish some versions of these Mac Venture games, I think on app versions and things like that. But the, uh, the art is excellent. I love these cards. They're very evocative. The art uh, really does sell the look of the game comes through the art and the feel of the dark kind of twisted nature of the castle and its inhabitants. I think the iconography is good. Everything looks really, really nice, especially in, I think, the item cards. All of the items look cool. Uh, it makes me want to engage with them, and I am excited whenever I draw one of these new cards in this game just to kind of see what it looks like. I also really enjoy the flavor text on the various quest cards. A huge column of wind spins violently, threatening to lift you off your feet and hurl you into the valley below. The well puzzle. The ancient well is choked with roots and various debris that has accumulated over the years. So while all the art and the flavor text is, is really well done and it makes me excited to engage with the cards, the overall theme of the game can sometimes get lost. Especially if you just focus on the card play and you don't get into the art and the flavor text. It can become a Pretty quickly, it can become more of a card playing game rather than an adventure game. And I think that's what it is. So, if, but if you're looking for something that really gives you that adventure feel, you may not find it in Shadowgate. But if you're looking for a thematic kind of card playing game where you are managing your resources, you are coming up with clever combinations of ways to cycle certain cards out of the deck and certain cards back into the deck and using your, your, uh, 
your puzzle items smartly and sacrificing your cards for victory points to get that edge on the other players, then you might really like this game. One other deck of cards that we didn't talk about here are the Jin Riddle cards. And uh, these come out at certain times, they are unlocked at quests. And these are another way that you can use your items. And so each of the riddles, you don't actually have to solve the riddle. There is a, li a little riddle and they'll give you the answer. And the answer is an item. And if you have that item, you can discard it to solve the gen riddle. And then each one of these will give you a certain bonus. And these are pretty powerful bonuses. So it's a good idea to maybe hold on to some of your items until you want to, uh, until you know that, that you have a possibility of drawing one of these Jin Riddle cards. Because uh, my character here, uh, Thuradan Ray, I, act I actually, um, I discarded the map sketch general item card. And right after that, I actually drew the Jin Riddle, but I was looking for that item card. There are ways though to uh, pull items out of the discard deck. So again, there are some combinations. You might want to go on a quest that you can uh, pull an item out of the discard deck in order to have a chance to solve this riddle and to get one of those special powers granted by the genie there. So overall, I think Shadowgate is pretty cool. It's not very expensive. I think it's under $50 and um, it does offer up a wealth of beautiful components with beautiful art and some good writing. Just know that it's not, I don't recommend Shadowgate as a solo game, even playing it two handed. I just wish that I was playing with other people. And so that is one thing that I just, I don't know how well this game plays with other people, but I imagine it being a much better competitive game because that how that's how it is designed. And it doesn't actually feel like an adventure game. It feels like a competitive card game. I would compare this game to something like the Dark Souls card game or the Bloodborne, uh, Bloodborne card game. Both of those are pretty good card games, but they don't feel like adventure games. And I think Shadowgate kind of fits in that same general area. Overall, even as a solo game, I have had fun. I do want to play this game with a couple friends in order to get a more full and representative experience with Shadowgate, the living castle. So, all right, you guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this look at Shadowgate and we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.